This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. And by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, to stay up to date on all the Mac Voices news. Subscribe from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, a show or two ago, we warned you that we were going to have Joe Kissel back on a regular basis because he's been updating so many things, and we're trying to play catch-up. And so he's back this time, but we're going to talk about updates to not one, not two, but three books, or maybe updates to two and a new book. Not quite sure how, how it all fits together, but Joe will tell us. Joe, great to have you back, as always. Thanks for making the time. Sure. And, you know, I'm not sure how they fit together either. I, <laughs> you know, I just keep writing books. And I, as, as, we, as we frequently discuss before and after the show, I totally lose track of, like, how much do they cost and when are they coming out and little details like that. Cause I'm, just, I'm just busy writing all the time. So um, I, <laughs> it, yeah, I don't know. Just, I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> yeah, just go buy them. Just go. Yeah, just just buy the books. Yeah, J- just buy them because that's it. Joe's Joe's not focused on the business. He's focused on research and development, and you know, getting the the information right for you. So, pretty much. In that's, fact, you know, we could just leave it at that. Like, buy the books, and thanks for watching. You know, and show cuts. <laughs> I think we need a little more meat to it, Joe. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Okay, but, you so know, I'm I'm trying to give your your listeners your your viewers a break by not making them watch three episodes for three books. It's a, it's a uh, it's a a triptych or a I don't know. It's it's yeah, yeah, three in okay. one. Okay, that works. That works. Okay, so and and in a, in a sense too, we should say that all three of these sort of go together. They're they're yes. not quite a series or a bundle, but they might as well be. Yeah. The the first one is version one point three of Take Control of Your Passwords. That's right. So um, this is uh, a book that, we, you know, <laughs> there was a book years and years ago that I wrote about passwords. And as time went on, I discovered that my advice was not only outdated, it was probably dangerous. So we decided to take a completely new look at passwords, um, one that is not exclusive to the Mac. It, it's equally a- applicable to other platforms. Uh, so Take Control of Your Passwords was that book. It came out a couple of years ago. And as things change, uh, which, you know, they do when you're talking about computers, uh, we've updated the book. So this is a relatively small update. It's version 1.3 for anyone who had the book before. It's a free update. I wanted to do a number of things. Uh, one is talk about uh, some changes that have that have happened in one password. So one password is is one of my favorite password managers and it's had a lot of new features. I I can't keep up with it. I mean, even in the last week, new features have appeared and they will keep on appearing. So it's, it's a little bit hopeless to keep that aspect of it up to date, but at least it's more up to date than it was. Um, I talk more about multi-factor authentication, give some slightly revised advice about a couple of topics. Um, there's, you know, one of the one of the things that I've been asked repeatedly about password managers like LastPass and Dashlane and One Password is, can I trust them? Like you're you're asking me to to seriously put all of my passwords in this app, but you know, can I can I trust the app? So I have uh, you know a, a sidebar that that addresses that very topic and the. Short answer is yes, you can trust them, um, but you shouldn't trust anything blindly when it comes to computers. So I, you know, lay out sort of my my arguments, my reasons why I think uh, that that you absolutely should trust a password manager and why it's certainly better than the alternatives. Um, but there, there are just a bunch of little things like that where I've I've sort of slightly revised my advice or added a little bit of detail. Uh, or you know, caught up the book to some some changes out there in the world, but the overall advice is still pretty much the same. You know, Joe, there are, t- there are times I get a little bit upset with uh, 
developers who just constantly release new updates because they're changing things that in, in programs that I rely on. I don't feel that way at all about 1Password because this is a battle that's ongoing. And 1Password <clears throat> is, is, is remaining competitive, I think. Um, there's an Apple Watch version. Uh, Part of it now, yep. which you know we have, has been debated as to why you need a password manager on your watch, but it, it's almost looking to the future, and I don't want to go off on that tangent. Yeah, I, I just think that the point here is that it's it is difficult for you to keep the keep up with this. I think it's more the general advice of you know which password managers or managers to look at, make sure you're using one, and then use a few basic concepts to help you just improve your security. You're never going to be completely secure, but improve it so that maybe just like, you know, the, the the house that has a sign on it that says protected by a burglar alarm, you're going to send people on, the bad guys on to the next place that isn't protected. Well, my house has one of those signs and, <laughs> uh, you know, has, has a few, and, and it's true. I do have a burglar alarm and it's one of those ones that's, you know, monitored 24 seven. And there have been a number of break-ins in our neighborhood, not in our house, thankfully. Um, if there were, I would be notified about it instantly on my iPhone, wherever I am. Um, but I have no idea whether it's because, you know, whether the, whether those signs have anything to do with the fact that, you know, nobody has broken in. Um, but they sure don't hurt. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, exactly. uh as, as you say, you know, so, like, the, there are signs and there's an alarm. But, you know, basically, if somebody threw a rock through the window, came in, grabbed some stuff and ran away. I mean, that could all happen in a minute long before police came long before, you know, and you really hope things like that don't happen. You, you have insurance or whatever, but I mean, as you say, there, there just isn't any perfect security. There's no perfect privacy. There's no perfect security. You kind of do your best. And, uh, you know, unless you are somebody who is really being specifically personally targeted, um, most of the time your your best is going to be good enough. It still amazes me too that people resist this kind of thing. That we still see passwords of one, two, three, or password, or whatever. And I don't even know what to say to that anymore. It's just like if if you're still doing that, I'm sorry, we love you, but you deserve whatever you get. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I take my son to preschool every morning, and uh, before the for the kids go in and after they go in, the uh, parents like to just stand around and chat. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was chatting with a couple of the the other mothers of, of kids, my uh, kids, uh, uh, kids in the same preschool class, and uh, one of them was just uh, very excitedly talking about LastPass, and. LastPass is what she uses for passwords, which is fine. And she was talking about, you know, how it, how she restored a backup, and just all these, all these ways that that LastPass is is helping her and making her feel more secure. So that's great. Like we're having this fantastic conversation about password managers. And then this this other mother who's standing and kind of listening in on this kind of goes, "Yeah, I kind of use the same password everywhere." And I know I shouldn't, but, and like we both gang up, we're like, no, you can't do that. That's so, uh, we're just kind of getting, she's like, I know, I know, but and we're like, well, you're, you're part of the problem. Like, and you know, again, it's like, we love you. It, it, we're not upset with you because we think you're stupid. Like we, we, we want to help you. We don't want you to suffer is, is the thing. And so it, it's not like I, it's, I'm upset for some philosophical reason or I think you're a bad person. It's, it's just that I, when I see you potentially harming yourself, that makes me sad. And so I, I, want, I want you to, to get over that little hump, just a little bit of extra effort that will potentially save you a world of pain in the future. Yeah. If you're still doing it, you're low-hanging fruit. That's right. That's right. Well, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So the, the hackers and the, the people who are trying to, you know, uh, acquire these massive databases of passwords to break into people's accounts and steal whatever, they are they are looking for the low hanging fruit. They are looking for the, the the people that require no special effort. Because, you know, if like you're targeting a politician or a celebrity or, or somebody with a lot of money you know that they have something that you want. And so it's worth kind of a lot of effort to get that. But if it's just an ordinary person like you and me, um, you don't know that that person has any money or power or influence. Uh, you're not going to waste a lot of time trying to break into their accounts. It's not worth it. So uh, 
the only way you are likely to, you know, particularly likely to get caught in one of those things is if you are the low-hanging fruit, if you have the really stupid, simple password. So just don't do that. <laughs> and we can say it over and over, but people are still going to do it. So I know. But go by. But there's a fine. You know, there's a fine if you if if you if your account is hacked because you used a stupid password. Uh, it's one thousand twenty four dollars. Um, I take PayPal, so it's really easy to pay your fine. Uh, obviously, it, it goes to me. Um, but uh, I, I really think there ought to there ought to be a deterrent like that because man, it's it's bad news. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think Joe, I've even seen some systems online that are now refusing to take certain passwords like that certain stupid yeah. passwords yeah uh some of them do and that's very wise of them yeah let's have more of that folks yes okay so that's book number one that's been that's, updated that's number one book number two takes some of this and spreads it a bit farther out take control of your online privacy this is the second edition of this this particular book that's right so uh Online privacy turns out to be a kind of big deal. Uh, it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Um, you know, the the very first uh, version of this book came out shortly after the whole uh, Edward Snowden revelations hit the news, and since then, just so many things have happened. Uh, we've learned a lot more about what government agencies are doing. We've learned a lot more about what corporations are doing, um, and you know, there there have been lots of laws passed and investigations performed and just lots of stuff going on with relation to online privacy. Um, overall, I mean, the situation isn't getting better. Like the, the average citizen can't feel more, more in control of their privacy today than they could a year or two ago. Um, and, and that's, that's very sad. I think the, uh, I, I think the situation is likely to get considerably worse before it gets better. But in any case, um, as new software and services uh, appear, as uh, laws change, as uh, new threats are discovered, and as, as I get feedback from readers saying, yeah, but what about this? Or I'm really wondering, you know, what should I do about this? Um, I felt like I, enough more needed to be said that this wasn't just a small update. This was like a pretty big update with lots of new pages and uh, and enough to warrant calling it a new edition. So this is Take Control of Your Privacy, second edition. And as with passwords, the, the core of it is still the same. The core of uh, the, the threats against your privacy and the types of things you'll do to protect it uh, are the same. But now we've just sort of layered on more stuff to it. Joe, do you have any specific thoughts uh, about some of the new photo sharing sites? And, and photo sharing systems we have, Apple's among them, of course. But it seems like now all of a sudden everybody is saying, oh, yeah, just just flip this little switch and all your photos will be up, uploaded to our cloud for safekeeping, which, which is great if you want to keep your photos. But at the same time, it introduces some interesting privacy issues. I have a lot of thoughts about that. I, you know, I wrote I wrote a big, long FAQ for tidbits about iCloud Photo Library. And uh, one of the topics that I now have quite a bit of expanded coverage uh, about in this book is, is exactly that, the photos you take on your mobile devices. Um, so for, for me, I, I really value uh, having all of my photos on all of my devices with next to no effort. So for me, something like iCloud Photo Library is, is really great. It's really handy. It, it saves me effort and it, it prevents me from, you know, losing photos. So that's, that's really nice. Um, but you know, I take photos of my kids pretty much. That's uh, very rarely do I take any pictures that don't have my kids in them, I guess. Um, and so it's just like, it's boring family stuff or stuff that's boring to anybody else. Um, you know, I take pictures on vacation, things like that. Um, if you are taking photos, of anything that you would be embarrassed for the, the general public to see or something that could get you in trouble with your job or with your school um, if you are you know if you are a spy if you're taking pictures of confidential business documents or unreleased Apple prototypes or if you are you know taking nude pictures to share with whomever I don't know I guess people do that it seems weird to me but whatever um, then that 
convenience feature of, oh, hey, my photos instantly sync everywhere automatically becomes a liability. Uh, it becomes a real serious danger to you because the more different places your photos are, the more different opportunities there are for someone that you don't want to have access to your photos to have access to your photos. So there's no, I mean, th there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's, uh, you can, you can use the services or not as, you know, whatever fits your needs, but I'm more just saying you got to think this through. Think about what it is that you take pictures of and think about the consequences that could occur if someone were to get a hold of those that wasn't someone you intended to have them. And if the consequences are, okay, well, a stranger saw a picture of flowers, then who cares? But if, if the consequences are I lose my job or I lose my marriage or I, you know, have death threats or, you know, there's some other very unwelcome um, consequence, then you have to give up some convenience and you, you just turn off that feature. And I, and I should say, along with that, it's not just the syncing part, like, like iCloud Photo Library. Uh, there's also backups. So if your iOS device or other mobile device automatically backs up its data to the cloud, as opposed to backing it up to your Mac, uh, then even if you don't sync your photos uh, with something like iCloud Photo Library, they could still be in your backups in the cloud. And so that's, you know back when there was that big celebrity photo hacking scandal, that's what happened was that somebody guessed a bunch of passwords and used those passwords to download the backups of the devices that were stored online and the backups contained those photos. So, um, so I just, I talk a lot about not just photos, but other aspects of mobile, mobile online privacy, uh, which I had just barely touched on in the first edition. Um, because it turns out there, there are lots of things you need to worry about when you're using a mobile device. Joe, how about any of the social networks? And I know we've had discussions in past shows about F Facebook in particular and the way they seem to shift their, their policies. But uh, instead of picking on Facebook, how about just social networks in general? Any, <clears throat> any thoughts on whether this is a, a major privacy kind of thing, given that, at least in theory, we're posting our own stuff to it? Yeah, uh, well, th there's a curious thing about social networks. Uh, the word social is, is right there in it, um, and right there in the name, you know. And uh, social implies, like, you know, other people seeing it. So basically my advice is uh, if you're going to post something on a social network, you have to assume that it's public. Now, you know, all of the social networks, most of them anyway, have a way of, like, you know, Twitter has direct messages. And there are, you can send messages uh, on Facebook and, and, you know, assign different groups and things. And, and there are mechanisms on most social networks that give you sort of the veneer of, of privacy. It's just between me and you, or just between me and this small group. Um, but you really can't trust those is the bottom line. It is a social network. They exist to spread information. There are ways that uh, people can work around those sort of, you know, private restrictions. Um, and even, even if, uh, it's not a matter of like your friends or your network seeing stuff. Certainly people that work at these companies can see your stuff and they could be hacked and then, you know, things could get out further. So, uh, basically what I say is, uh, you know, use a social network for social purposes for things that you don't mind having the public know. But if you want to keep something private, that is just really not the right place for it. And, and I, I'm very, um, very skeptical of trusting private information to the, you know, the private feature of a social network. The other thing, and, I, and again, I think we've talked about it, but I'll throw it in anyway. The number of services are out there that are saying, yes, join our service and sign in with your Facebook ID. Sign in with your Twitter ID. No, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've just handed the keys. Now, it, admittedly, there's probably not anybody that's going to go through here and pick out your individual password and, and uh, an ID to try to log into your Facebook account. But at the same time, you're handing that over to someone. Why would you do that? Well, it, it's not quite as bad as you make it sound. It's not? Um, no, no. Um, it, uh, Maybe, maybe getting into the exact mechanism by which that works is a topic for another show. Um, when, you, when you use uh, you know, Twitter or Facebook or, or 
Google or whatever to sign into somebody else's account, um, they're they're authenticating. They're they're not actually. You're not giving your password to that service. It looks like you are, so it does does have that appearance. Uh, but in fact, that password is is only being validated with the other service. The password itself is never given to that third party, um, and so it's it's. I'll just say safer than it looks. Having said that, I still don't do it. I, and, I, and I recommend having a separate password for each service. Um, what will happen is, you know, if, if, your, if your Facebook password is compromised and you used Facebook to log into some other service, that does not mean that somebody else can then use your Facebook password to log into that other service. That's just not the way this mechanism works. Um, however, um, if you're using a password manager, there's essentially no cost. There's no additional effort required to have a unique password for everywhere. And because using one service to log into another introduces a another potential risk vector, you know, like it's another another avenue that hackers could look at to try to tease out another vulnerability. I, I just say, why bother with that? Why, why give them the, the chance, even if it looks fairly secure um, in, in the way it's implemented right now, who knows whether you know, another vulnerability might not be discovered in the future. So, so just reduce the risk and, uh, and use a different password everywhere. And if you're using one of those password managers, it's it's just easy. There's no difference in using that same password versus a different complex password. It's you're, right. you're just picking from a menu. So that's right. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. Get a full free 10-day trial at Lynda.com/MacVoices. If you're listening to or watching Mac Voices. I'm betting it's because you like to learn more about how to do amazing things with your Apple tech and beyond. That's why lynda.com should be just perfect for you, because not only can you learn more about using Apple-related programs and gear, but also about all sorts of things, even non-tech things, like personal finances, negotiations, management, or go in a different direction with K-12 education or higher education, or switch over to video production or photography or lots more. Lynda.com has something for everyone, no matter what your interest is or your expertise level is. And the best thing about it is that you can do just that. Switch from one topic to another quickly at no extra expense. Since once you subscribe, every single course and topic on Lynda.com is available for you whenever you want. I've been getting up to speed on a service that I really haven't fully embraced yet, Evernote. Lynda.com has made it easy, not only to learn, but because I haven't been at home much when I have time to watch, I can take lynda.com with me via their iPhone and iPad app, so I can watch when and where I want, even offline. Right now, you can surf over to lynda.com slash macvoices, that's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash macvoices, and sign up for a 10-day free trial. That means you can watch any lynda.com course for the next 10 days with no obligation, or as many different courses as you want. Sample training in Excel, programming for iOS 8, Google Docs, and a whole lot more. That's 10 days of training free at lynda.com slash macvoices. Sign up now and let me know what courses you decided to watch during your free trial. I'm on Twitter as Chuck Joyner or drop me an email at chuck at macvoices.com. lynda.com slash macvoices to learn something new today. Thanks to lynda.com for their support of Mac Voices. Anything else in online privacy that we should specifically be aware of before we move on? Uh, there, there are a few things. So I, I talked about the whole uh, mobile thing. So in addition to like photos and backups of your photos, uh, you're you're going to want to be aware of some other dangers of using cellular networks. Um, there was the whole big thing about super cookies. So uh, AT and T and Verizon had this special tracking mechanism built into uh, their networks so that even if you had cookies turned off in your browser, you could be uniquely identified and tracked every site you visit. Um, that's kind of evil. It, it, AT&T turned it off. Verizon sort of lets you opt out. But other things like that could still be out there. Uh, you have to be aware of 
apps tracking your location when you're using a mobile device, and sort of a whole long list of other things. So big, big new chapter on, on privacy when you're using your mobile device, because cellular, cellular networks really do change the equation quite a bit. I also have an expanded uh, coverage of the Internet of Things. So, you know, your Internet-connected light bulbs and light switches and door locks and whatever. All of, you know, it's it's really, you know, you can get uh, an Internet-connected water filter. There, there's like almost no <laughs> object that you can point to in your house that there isn't an Internet-connected version of it. Um yeah, sure, set-top boxes, you know, your TiVo and your Xbox and whatever, those are kind of obvious, but but all these other things, the little things that, that now have internet connections, I talk about those. So, you know, if, if an object in your house is internet connected, your thermostat, you know, whatever, um, one of the implications of that is that someone who can get access to that data can tell not only when you're home and when you're not, but even what room of the house you're in. Um, they people can learn an awful lot of potentially scary things about you if these objects were to be hacked or you know the, the internet uh, data transfer were to be uh, intercepted. And unfortunately, a lot of these objects don't have very good security, in some cases, barely any at all. So a whole chapter on, um, you know, things you need to worry about there. Um, and I'm just looking down at my list here, you know, some, oh, yeah, right. So talking about um, malware that can activate your uh, computer's uh, camera or microphone without you knowing it, like maybe your camera is on, but the green light isn't on to let you tell you it's on. So it's actually recording what you're doing in your, in your office or your home without you knowing it. Um, some uh, expanded discussion about email privacy and uh, web, uh, you know, ex uh, browser extensions for uh, for web privacy. Um, and I talk about uh, data brokers. So these are companies that exist only to collect and resell your personal data, not necessarily because they want to show you ads, but because they want to sell your data to other people who want to do stuff to it and sort of what to do about uh your personal data being in all these databases all over the world. And, and uh, last but not least, um, every copy of this book um, comes with a, a privacy-enhancing device that I invented. Um, so this is not, I have to clarify, this is not a tinfoil hat because that would be stupid. This is uh, high-grade aluminum, and as you can see, it has a lovely space gray finish. And uh, this will totally protect you from, uh, you know, companies trying to zap your brainwaves and, uh, you know, get direct access to your thoughts. So if you're really concerned about your online privacy, especially with all the Wi-Fi and cellular networks, you'll want to have this uh, stylish accessory. I like it. I, I think you should appear in every show <laughs> wearing that. I think that's... It's it's kind of hot. It's yeah. uh, <laughs> not a lot of ventilation. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Okay, so those are the first two of the three we're going to cover, and those are both updates. To be clear, and yes, so so the passwords is a free update, and the online privacy is is a paid update because it's a much bigger uh, second edition. Great. So now we come to what amounts to a brand new book, but we'll talk about how it was published because it didn't just spring fully formed and that's take control of security for mac users right so that would seem to be a bit of an overlap with some of the things we've talked about but maybe a little more specific to mac users but this was one of those books that uh the, the chapters were published as chapticles through tidbits for paid members right so we we did talk about this book uh, a few months ago um as as tidbits has done with a few books um, the, the way we decided to, to publish it initially was one chapter at a time. So uh, one chapter a week, um, and it was published uh, on the Tidbits website. The first couple of chapters were available to anyone, but the remaining chapters were available only to paid Tidbits members. Um, and so those people got early access to it. And in addition to early access, they got to provide feedback. So we, in, in the course of 
the, those 12 weeks during which all the chapters are being published, we incorporated a lot of comments and corrections and questions that readers brought up as the chapticles were published and use those to revise and improve the final book, which is now available uh, just you know, just like any other take control book in the usual formats for sale to anyone. So it's basically the same content that was published for uh, Tibbetts members, uh, only it's better because it's, it's very much polished and cleaned up and enhanced uh, with all of that feedback. Okay, so I guess I should, should say what's new in this version of the book? What, what kind of topics do you cover that might not be specifically covered uh, in, in any detail in the other books. All right. So the other two books we talked about, the passwords and online privacy, uh, one of the things about those is they are platform neutral. So they are applicable if you have, you know, Windows, Android, whatever. Take Control of Security for Mac users is strictly for Mac, and it's also strictly about security. So as I talk about in a couple of these different books, Security and privacy are very closely related, but they're not the same thing. So one of the examples I give, and I, I've, probably, I've probably given this example on this show before, but there have been so many who can remember, so I'll give it again. Um, so when I'm trying to explain the difference between privacy and security, and, and also anonymity, which, which figures in, I talk about a bear. So go to a zoo and... There's a, there's a bear or many bears over there in an enclosure, and there's like a fence, a wall, a moat, whatever. The bears uh, are not going to hurt you, and also you're not going to hurt the bears. So you have mutual security. The bears are safe from you, and you are safe from the bears. There are physical barriers in place. However, uh, the bear doesn't have any privacy because, I mean, everybody's standing around looking at them, and you don't have any privacy either because you're out in public. So this is an example of a place where you do have security, but you don't have privacy. Now I can flip that around. Let's say you go camping and you're in a tent out in the middle of the woods. You do have privacy because you're far away from other people and you're inside uh, an opaque enclosure. Nobody can see you. Nobody can hear you. You do have privacy, but don't have security because if that bear comes along, you know, one swipe through your little flimsy tent and you're gone. So you can have security without privacy. You can have privacy without security. Now, as the bear is in the process of mauling you, uh, you're still anonymous because the bear doesn't know who you are. But once your remains are identified, you will lose your anonymity because we will all know who you were. So privacy, security, and anonymity three different concepts. You can have any one or two without the others, um, but they often go together. So the fact that I close my front door and lock it gives me privacy. That is, nobody walking by outside can see me, but also it keeps me safe because it makes it much harder for someone to come in that I don't want to come into my house. Um, and online, it's the same thing. Um, you take security measures in order to protect your privacy. It is still possible to have security without privacy and privacy without security online. And in fact, not all of these security measures that you might want to take are strictly to protect your privacy. There are other senses in which you want to be secure that, you know, where privacy itself just isn't an issue. Um, but the, the two concepts do very, go, very much go together. So although there is some overlap between the online privacy book and the Mac security book, um, the security book is narrower in the sense of only talking about your Mac, but broader in the sense of talking about um, more different kinds of security issues than just those that affect your privacy. Joe, I think there's a feeling that carries over f from the old days and well, from the not-so-old days about the Mac operating system and how secure we are and the fact that Apple does a pretty good job in a lot of areas. Maybe not as good as we might like in some, but for the most part, it, we're, we're a pretty secure environment. We're a pretty safe environment. We don't have to worry about all those annoying antivirus things and malware things, and some of that is changing 
because of browser technology. That's a whole other discussion. And then you flip over to iOS, and we have the, the infamous walled garden of Apple that theoretically protects us, as opposed yeah. to Android being out there, you know, the wild, wild west. Are those perceptions still true? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so you want to get the hat, Joe? <laughs> I, I might need my hat. Last week, I was at a, a conference um, full of people who uh, work at, at um, like uh, Apple resellers and, and Apple repair shops. So uh, a lot of these people are technicians who every single day deal with customers coming in with with problems with their Mac, and a lot of those customers, surprisingly enough to me, have had malware problems. And so I was asking some of these techs about this, like, really, you know, it didn't seem to me like there was that much malware out there. And um, so as, as we were digging into exactly what was going on, um, it, it turned out that most of the malware that these guys are seeing are, are a very specific variety. It's adware. So the purpose isn't to disable your computer or to steal your data. The purpose of this malware is just to show you ads and get you to buy stuff. Now, I, I don't like that, but I mean, it's less harmful than some malware, but it's very, very annoying because it will pop up ads that are uh, very intrusive and hard to get rid of. And, and it uses scare tactics. You're like, oh no, your Mac might be you know vulnerable to this, that, or the other thing. So you need to pay us money. Um, so this kind of this kind of stuff is is pretty rampant, and I never encounter it because I don't go to you know those sites to download files, and I don't uh, click on suspicious links in uh, scammy looking email messages. And if I if something pops up in my browser saying, "Oh no, your Mac might be infected," I'm like, "You got to be kidding me!" But <laughs> but I am I am not the ordinary person in this respect because I've been you know, really into uh, security stuff for a long time. I know what to look for. I know what I'm doing. A lot of people don't. And so as, as it turns out, a lot of people are tricked into, uh, you know, by, because of ads and because of phishing, they are tricked into downloading uh, adware and other malware. And so the enemy, it, it's not so much that Mac users face a technological problem. It's really, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say to say stupidity, but it's you know it, it is the users that are the problem. It is people not being cautious and uh, blindly installing things and kind of you know believing everything they see on the web. That is is really the you know the, the way all this stuff gets onto people's Macs, and it's a really a, a much bigger problem than I perceived it to be. Um, Macs are, are you know, have pretty good security and for the most part are, uh, you know, pretty safe against viruses. But there's, if you deliberately install software and you ignore those warnings that come up, well, there's only so much Apple can do. And uh, so the burden isn't really on Apple to fix that kind of a problem. Um, th there's probably more they could do, but really the burden is on each user to be more aware of of what the threats are and what's going on and how to compute a little more safely. Not too long ago, I had a friend call a friend of a friend and say, you know, Hey, I, I, I thought I had a problem. I got a, a warning on my computer. And so I clicked to install this particular alleged security package that is in the news right now that I won't mention. Mm -hmm. And now I can't get rid of it. And Oh my God, all I see is ads and it's a disaster. And, it, it took, I don't know how long to try to get that back out. It, you're right. It's amazing. It's amazing how people will, will, will fall for this stuff. Um, and, and I'm sure now you've had the same experience I have where you get a phone call from someone with a very thick foreign accent, for those of us in the U.S., saying, you know, we've been getting uh, virus warnings from your computer. And, you know, we we would like for you to, you know, we'd like to help you. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah, um, and and it's. I mean, I know how to deal with those phone calls, and it like takes me about two seconds to go. You've got to be kidding me, <laughs> you know. But but if you know, if my mom got a phone call like that, she would be seriously worried. Absolutely. And I've certainly, absolutely talked to people who who have gotten calls like that and just been like, oh, well, they clearly know something I don't know, 
and uh, they're they're just they're just super super evil. <laughs> yeah. So um, so it's not that it's not that Max are inherently insecure. It's that what you don't know can hurt you. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this book is to tell you what you might not already know about security that you should know to make smarter decisions. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. I've, I've written about Mac security. Uh, my, my last book on Mac security was, was, was this one, you know, <laughs> 900 pages long. And as I like to say, uh, it's, it's most effective use as a security tool is as a bludgeon. Ow. Um, so, uh, the, the problem with doing a book like that is that somebody is going to say, oh no, now I'm terrified. I need to read 900 dense pages of technical stuff to even consider, you know, keeping my Mac secure. And I, and I realized, you know, much too late, that's really sending the wrong message. Um, the message I should be sending is, you know, you, you need to, be aware of some things. You need to be smarter about some things, maybe change some settings, maybe install a couple of apps. You don't need to be terrified. You don't need to know a whole lot of technical stuff. Uh, you just need to be a little bit smarter. And so this book, the, the new Mac security book, is about one-sixth the length of, of uh, you know, this old guy. Um, so it's, it's much more digestible. And I've tried to really avoid as much as possible the the technical details about you know exactly how things work behind the scenes and and stuff that you don't I mean what you really need to know is do i need to turn this on or not uh do i need to install this software or not which setting here is the best for me and so i i try to kind of take that angle and i also try to filter all of it through what's your risk level if you are using your mac solely for web browsing and streaming music, then, you know, your, your risk level is pretty low. If you're, you know, a politician or an Apple executive, your risk level is really, really high. And most of us are, are somewhere in between, but the, the extent to which you try to like lock down everything and turn on all the security features and, and do all that stuff, uh, should, should be, calibrated to your risk level. I don't just say, well, turn on everything because then your, your life is just going to be so awkward and so inconvenient. Um, it, it depends. And so that's one of the things the book tries to do is to help you figure out exactly how much of a risk do you face. And given that, what are the appropriate steps to protect yourself? I think I've said this a number of times over the past six to 12 months, but this might be one of the most important books that you've written. And this is the one that I wish people would buy and give to a friend, you know, buy a copy for a friend and it's an electronic copy so you can email it. So it's not like it's a big deal. But and that includes, you know, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, uh, co-workers, you know, because I see things in in my work life. I see things that are just unbelievable from a security standpoint and people do it because they don't know any better. Right. That's that's the whole thing. They don't know any better. And. I, I don't want to take the approach of, oh, you're just hopeless because you did this, you know, right. lame thing. I want to say, I can understand why you did that because, you know, somebody said that you should, uh, they were lying and, or they were, you know, <laughs> trying to scam you. So here's, sorry, you know, sorry you had to go through that. Um, but here's what's happening and why. And now here's the way you should respond to that. So there are things that I don't do on my personal Macs because uh, either I've tried them and they've turned out to be more bothered than they're worth or just because my risk level in that particular area is a lot lower because of what I know. Um, there are also some security measures I take that other people would go, I would never, ever put myself to such a huge inconvenience. Adam Engst and I have had this discussion um, a number of times with relationship to um, how long your max login password is. Uh, so, uh, my, my position is that your max login password should be pretty long and pretty random. Uh, and, uh, Adam has his, his own arguments for why it, it shouldn't be as long or as random. Um, we don't have to have that debate here, no, but not going to. Uh, he, he's a little bit, he's a little bit stunned that I would type in such a long, awkward password every time I use my Mac. Uh, but 
in in my world and from my way of thinking, um, that is one of those areas where I feel it is very, very appropriate to incur that slight inconvenience. Whereas in, in other senses, um, a, a lot of people do things that I would just say are, are completely ridiculous and unnecessary. So I guess we need to wrap this up because we've been going at it for a while. And any last words on, uh, on the new security book that you think are important? We've had a lot of them, but you know, what do you, anything other than just the fact that you're trying to educate people and, and not, not make them feel ignorant, but educate them where they need it? Yeah, this is this is not a scary book. It's a book as as I try very hard to do with all of my books. It's a it's a book for ordinary people written in plain English. It's not an attempt to make you feel scared. It's an attempt to do actually the opposite of that. It's an attempt to empower you and tell you exactly what you don't need to be scared of. But it's also at the same time trying to make you smarter and uh, just help you make wiser decisions that will protect your security. Uh, so it's, it's a lot shorter than the old book. It's, it's a pretty easy read, I think. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's in it, uh, is, takes really very little effort to do. But if you learn nothing from the book other than, um, having an increased awareness of what is likely to be, uh, a dangerous website or a, a scammy email message or harmful software, um, and and you you're a little more hesitant when you install stuff or download stuff. I, I I will feel like I've done you a great service. All the books can be had at takecontrolbooks.com, of course, along with all of Joe's other books and a lot of other great books by great authors. These though, I, I got to tell you, folks, I think this the, these are some of the most important books out there, just because once you get hit. You know, we've probably the only other things are backups because that's lost data, lost things that can't be recreated. This can take stuff from you that you may never get back. And if you do, it could cost you a lot. And it's, right. And it's just it's just not that hard if you just pay attention to, to Joe's advice. That's right. And of these three books, I would say, well, of course, of course, you should buy all of them. I mean, that goes without saying. But if you had to buy just one of the three, I would say buy the security book because um, it mentions passwords, does not go into very much detail about them, but it, it talks about them to some extent. It mentions online privacy issues, again, doesn't go into as much detail. Uh, but you can sort of say, okay, now that I know the basics of passwords, the basics of online privacy. Now I want to read the other book for a lot more detail in that particular area. So uh, of, of the three, I think the, the Mac security book, assuming, of course, that you are a Mac user, um, I think that's probably a safe assumption on this podcast. Uh, the Mac security book is, is probably the best overview and the best place to start. One more time, take control of your passwords, version 1.3, take control of your online privacy, second edition, and Take Control of Security for Mac Users, brand new, all from Take right Control Books. Joe, thank thank you for the time here, but thank you for the effort in putting all this together. This is great information. I, I just hope everyone heeds your advice and makes themselves more secure, both online and offline. I, I certainly hope so, and, and thank you, Chuck, for your time. Yes, and, and make sure we need to publish the, public, the, uh, the directions to fold the hat. Yes, uh, <laughs> you know that was. I, I I set out to uh, to to make a hat because I wanted to have this as as a prop. One of my talks at this conference, and it was it was actually quite challenging. There there are videos on YouTube for how to make a a, a, a tin foil hat, but I didn't like any of them. I thought they were all just silly looking. So um, I and you know I didn't even use any tape. This is a this is solely aluminum foil. So it was it was a challenge and. Uh, maybe I need to make my own YouTube video about how I did. Yeah, take control of your tinfoil hat. I like it. Right on. I like it. Joe, thanks a lot. Good to see you. You too. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We'll be back with more from Joe Kissel because he's still got more stuff to update us on and more from lots of other people that you'll want to hear from. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com newsletter. 
Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.